morning, everyone. Thank you all again for coming up forward. Please continue. So can one of you please lead us in prayer? Anyone? In-person students? Who has the mic? Mic is here. Diksha, can you lead us in prayer, please? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, Heavenly Father, thank you for this time again that we are having the learning your word. And Lord, help us to learn in your word and we will learn about Christology, Lord. Uh, give your knowledge and wisdom so we will learn properly and we will apply in our life. And Lord, give your knowledge and wisdom to ma'am also, Lord, so that he will teach us, Lord, your word. Lord, thank you, Jesus. Bless this class, Lord, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Diksha. So, um, on Tuesday, we were studying chapter 5, and we tried to understand how Jesus was fully God, fully man, true God, true man, 100% God, 100% man, when he lived here on the earth. And we also saw that when Jesus became man, he did not cease to be what he was eternally. Okay, that means he did not stop being who he was or what he eternally was. That is, he was God. Rather, we see that the eternal God took on the fullness of humanity. Okay, he did not stop or cease from being who he eternally was. That is God. Rather, he, this eternal God took on the fullness of humanity in spirit, soul and body. And he, while limiting himself uh, in the manifestations of his divinity. Okay, so he, he limited himself from manifesting his divinity. Okay, and uh, we also looked at the seven steps of the incarnation. Where do we find the seven steps of the incarnation? Do we find the seven steps of incarnation? Philippians 2, 6, 8. 2 verses 6 to 8. Okay. Lucy, did you say something? Ah, Philippians 2, 6 to oh, 8. I can't hear uh, the online students. Okay. Okay. Um, so we saw in the seven steps of the incarnation in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 8, that Christ was in the form of God. Christ was equal with God. He did not consider it to be equal with God. He made himself of no reputation. He took on the form of a bond servant. He came in the likeness of man and he was also found in the appearance of a man. Okay. Uh, can one of you, one of the online students speak something so that we can check if we can hear you, please? Praise the Lord. Yes, thank you, Lucy. We could hear you yeah. loud and clear. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So in uh, then we began looking at chapter 6. And in chapter 6, we studied the humanity of Christ. Okay. So we're looking at how Jesus was fully human, how he was really human in all areas. So we, um, uh, we looked at his, um, uh, how he was physiologically, physically, intellectually, mentally, and biologically, okay? How he was thirsty, how he was uh, hungry, how he, um, you know, felt pain, how he also cursed the fig tree, okay? So that is what we, we studied so far. But in chapter 6, we are basically looking at or studying the humanity of Christ. And uh, we are going to discover that Christ was really human in all areas but he willingly restricted himself uh, to the limitations of being a human being he was fully human but being divine we see that he limited himself okay or he restricted himself to the limitations of being a human being and in every way he was truly human except that he was Sinless. Thank you, Diksha. In every way, he was human, 
except that he was sinless. Okay. And we also looked at uh, or we understood the importance of incarnation. Why God had to become human. Why the word became flesh. Okay. And uh, we are going to also look at why was it necessary for Jesus to become a human being. Okay. So we will continue looking at, we looked at his um, physiological development. We looked at his intellectual, mental, his uh, biological. Now we look uh, uh, at um, the physiological, sorry, the psychological. Okay, psychological has to do more with your emotions, um, with your, um, uh, you know, mental, in, internal, spiritual, what you express, all of those areas. Okay. So we see that Jesus was fully human uh, psychologically, which means he expressed compassion. Okay. When did he express compassion? How do we know that Jesus expressed compassion? Can you please take the mic from Diksha and speak so our uh, online students can hear? How did he show kindness? Uh, during healing and when crowd were following him, so he, Jesus told uh, regarding their food, so these things. Okay, he had compassion on the people even though he was tired and he's trying to run away from people. But when he reached the other side, he saw all of them waiting for him, coming on foot, they ran before him. And Jesus had compassion and it says he healed them all. Okay. So he also showed compassion when he healed people. He had mercy on them. He had compassion over them when he fed them when there was no food available. Okay. He also expressed joy. When did he express joy? Look at Matt, John chapter 15 verse 11. When did he express joy? Can somebody please read uh, uh, John chapter 15 verse 11 These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full Yes. so what is the joy he's talking about what is the joy that he's talking about here Father's love and his commandments abiding in us. Okay, Father's love and his commandments, obeying the Father's commandments, obedience to the Father and abiding in the Father, okay? What is the joy he's talking about here? Was it joy because of people around him or all the miracles he was doing and all the uh, fan following that he was having? Then what was the joy? Because he was doing the will of his master, God. Okay, he was, he was doing the will of his uh, father. Thank you, Kofi. Yes, get through. As a um, fruit of the spiritual gift, joy. Amen. Thank you, get through. The fruit of the spirit is joy. Okay, and we know that joy is irrespective of the circumstances, right? The fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience. You can experience peace in the midst of the storm. Like Jesus experienced peace in the midst of the storm. You can experience joy in the midst of suffering and pain. You can experience love or you can show love in the midst of animosity, even when people are not good to you, when even people hate you, um, they talk bad against you. You know, you show them love. And that is because of the fruit of the Spirit. It's not something that we can bear in our own strength, but it is the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So what does it show us here? When Jesus expressed this kind of joy, what is this showing us or teaching us? He's bearing the fruit of the Spirit. Yes, thank you, Kofi. He was bearing the fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. That means it shows that Jesus was fully human, 
okay and even when he was human he was obedient to the father he was doing the will of the father he was intimate with the father he was in the bosom of the father like we read in in john chapter 1 okay he was very intimate very close with the father and he was abiding in the father like nelson says okay um and we read in john chapter 15 when you know abide in the wine you will bear much fruit okay so this fruit is also talking about the work of the holy spirit in our lives so we see that jesus was fully human and he manifested the sonship glory because he was manifesting the fruit of the spirit who god is through his nature what that what god does you know the gifts of the spirit okay so here we see that he expressed joy even in the midst of pain suffering even when people were ready to stone him kill him push him off the cliff you know talk bad against him he was he experienced uh, he expressed joy okay he also expressed anger when did jesus express anger in the temple okay when he cleansed the temple when else in the boat okay one of the in-person students saying when the disciples and jesus was in the boat and jesus was tired and he was fast asleep there also we see peace the fruit of the spirit peace nobody can sleep when the boat is rocking and then there's water falling on them but he was in deep sleep showing that he is so much in peace that nothing can destroy his life nothing can take his life without the father's will okay but he experienced he expressed anger uh so the in-person student is saying in the boat when when the disciples woke him up and said jesus you know we're going to die and then he um he says why are you so afraid you know um why don't you have faith okay so we don't know if that was really anger in the sense or you know frustration or what okay maybe anger okay what where else did we do we see jesus's anger on the day of sabbath okay when people try to test him so that time jesus got angry okay on the day of sabbath when jesus uh, they, they they try to test jesus okay when else was he angry transfiguration okay when he, when uh, when jesus asked them who do you say Let's make a, a tent for each one of them, okay? That is, does, does he say it then? He doesn't say it then. Yeah. He says, he says, take the mic, please. Our online students will be totally lost. Yeah, that is when Jesus when when Jesus says, "Who do you say I am?" He says, "You are the Christ, the Son of the Living God." Okay. So, to the Peter, get behind me of Satan. It came when, when uh, Jesus prophesied about his crucifixion, and Peter said, "This thing will not happen." Ah, and then he says. Then get Peter said, me. "Get behind me of Satan." Satan. Okay. When uh, Jesus healed people and the Pharisees and Sadducees said, it's not lawful for you to do this on the Sabbath. Jesus was very angry uh, with, um, uh, with them. Actually, this anger was not like, uh, you know, when we talk about anger, it's not kind of the anger that we have. Okay. It was more uh, uh, a righteous kind of an anger. It was more grieving in the heart. Okay. It was like, how can these people be so hard-hearted when somebody is, you know, not able to use their hand or they're not able to walk, they're paralyzed. And these people, instead of thanking God for the miracle that has happened, they are basically, you know, uh, showing their frustration and saying that it's un unlawful for you to do this on a Sabbath day. Okay. Sanjay says when he rebuked the Pharisees, yes. Um, uh, when he says in Matt, uh, Sanjay also mentions Matthew chapter 12, verse 34 and 35, says, You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? Yes. Yeah. That is when um, they are getting back at 
Jesus. Okay. Okay. So Jesus also expressed sorrow. Okay. Uh, when did he express sorrow? When Lazarus died. Okay. When else did he express sorrow? Online students, when did Jesus express sorrow? In Gethsemane, okay, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Thank you, Lucy. Okay, uh, when did he express loneliness? At the cross, okay, when God, uh, when God the Father turned away from him, when Jesus says, uh, uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken? Me. Matthew chapter 27 verse 46 we also read in Matthew chapter 26 verses 37 and 38 in the garden of Gethsemane okay we also see that Jesus was tempted as we we were okay or we are when when was he tempted sorry yeah when he was fasting Matthew chapter 4 verses 1 to 11 Okay, so why are we looking at all of these passages? Why are we looking at whether Jesus was, how he was physiologically, biologically, you know, intellectually? Uh, why are we looking at all of these physiologically? Yes. Okay, why are we looking at it? Sister, that to prove that he was 100% human like okay. us. Okay, thank you, Sister Getru. Thank you, Lucy. When to just show that he was fully human, just like us. Okay. Okay. He was also setting us a model. Okay, so we look at more of uh, Jesus' humanity. Uh, he was a descendant of David. Okay, so we are looking at his natural lineage. That means. Uh, you know, he just did not just drop down from heaven, okay? But he had a ancestry, he had roots, he had a family tree, he had a descent. And what was his natural lineage? From which family did he come from? David, yes. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, on in-person in students. He came from the, the tribe of, okay, from the family of David. Okay, look at the. Uh, sorry, Kofi, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, the tribe of Judah. Yes, thank you. He came from the tribe of Judah. Okay, look at Romans chapter 1, verse 3. Can somebody please read that? Romans chapter 1, verse 3, please. Romans chapter 1, verse 3. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh. Yes. So um, here in Romans chapter 1, verses uh, 3, and if you look at verses 4 and 5, you know, um, uh, we see that, uh, uh, you know, uh, Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Rome, and he's telling them that, you know, um, Jesus was born of the seed of David, from the family of David, the lineage of uh, David, and he came in the flesh, okay? Um, if you look at verses 4 and 5, it says, who are the Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises of whom are the fathers, and from whom according to the flesh, Christ came, who is overall eternally blessed God. Amen. So we see here that you know, Christ came in the flesh and he's trying to prove that Christ came in the flesh and he's saying that he was born of, of the seed of David. That means his lineage or his family or his roots, ancestry was from David. Okay. Uh, look at also what 1 John chapter 1 verses 1 to 3 says. Can somebody else please read that? What is the Apostle John's testimony? That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you may have fellowship with us, 
and truly our fellowship is with the father and with his son jesus christ amen so what is the apostle john trying to say here in these verses what is apostle john saying here from in these verses who is he talking about jesus christ what is he yeah. saying about jesus christ Right. He's talking about the incarnation, okay? Use the mic, please. Anyone speaking? Can you please use the mic? John is talking about uh, he took the uh, flesh, came into the flesh from what? Okay, who, who came into Jesus. Flesh? Okay, God became flesh, flesh okay? Yeah. And what is he saying about that? What is John explaining here in verse 1 to 3? The fellowship they had with Jesus when he was there, they have seen, they have been with him in a physical presence, and uh, that's what he's revealing to us. Okay, so Apostle John is saying that, hey, this God became flesh, and we actually communicated with him. We had fellowship with him. Lucy says, God who took on human form, yes. But what is John saying more in detail? He's saying, hey, this is God who became flesh. But we had, you know, uh, fellowship with him. We uh, connected with him. We saw, saw him with our eyes. You know, we uh, touched him. We handled him, you know. Um, and he was, um, we've seen his life. We've examined him. You know, the li life was manifested and we have seen, yes, get truth says, we bore witness. That means we bear witness that, yes, there's not this mythological figure, but there's somebody in reality. He was fully human and um, he says, this life was manifested. We have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the father, was manifested to us. So he's saying, yes, this is. God who is eternal, okay, God who was with the Father, look at verse 2, you know, underline that in your Bible, it says God who is eternal was with the Father but was manifested to us, was made known to us in a real tangible way. And so what, he's, what is he saying? What is he saying here in verse 3? What is he saying in verse 3? He's saying, yes, have fellowship. have fellowship with him. Just like we had the privilege of fellowshipping with him, you know, um, so also you can have, truly have fellowship with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So John is basically taking the effort to make known who Jesus Christ is. Not just he was a man, but he is this eternal life, this eternal God who was with the Father, but who became flesh, who manifested uh, to us, made himself to, known to us. And we have had the, the privilege of fellowshipping with him, you know, of hearing him, seeing him, handling him. And he's saying, hey, you also can have fellowship with him. Okay. So if anyone asks you, what is the proof? There is a proof that Jesus is God and he became man. 1 John chapter 1 verses 1 to 3. Why can you, uh, and of course John chapter 1, but here it, more in 1 John chapter 1 verses 1 to 3. Why? Why am I saying that this is a good proof to show people that eternal God became man in the fullest sense and not some mythological figure no that very essence of uh, seeing jesus in flesh and blood in, in real okay the very essence of seeing jesus in flesh and blood very real okay here is a testimony of a person right and when you when you go to the court you know when somebody you say hey this is a murderer do they just take them and put them into jail or uh, hang them or give them the punishment what do they do they're looking for witnesses, 
right? Witnesses and the murder weapon is very, very important. So if they have witnesses who say, hey, I saw this person doing it, that's more than enough, right? So here we have a witness of John who lived and he's saying, hey, we have seen this eternal God manifesting himself to us and we've had fellowship with him, okay? So this is a testimony of the incarnate son of God, okay? The son of God who, you know, the apostles, the disciples, the people saw, looked upon, touched, okay? And saying that his humanity was real, he was really flesh and blood, okay? Look at what First Timothy chapter 2 verse 5 says. First Timothy chapter 2 verse 5. Can somebody read that please? For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. So what is Paul writing to Timothy here and revealing about Jesus Christ? He's a mediator? Yes. Between God and men. Thank you, Sister Gertrude. He's a mediator between God and man. Okay, what does it mean here? He's a mediator between God and man. That means he intercedes for us, for men, to God. He, okay, he intercedes to us before God, okay? He connects us with God, like a bridge. So. Okay, he connects um, uh, us to God like a bridge, yeah. okay? He became a high priest for us. Okay, thank you, Lucy. He became a high priest for us. That means he was our representative. He was representing us before God. And to represent us before God, he had to be fully human like us, okay? So he can understand us, he can reveal... Uh, about us to the Father, make us known to the Father. So he was a true representative of the human race before the Father, okay? And he was like, um, Nelson said, he was reaching out up to the Father on behalf of us. He was building a bridge, okay? He was using himself as a bridge between the Father and humanity, okay? So as a man, he was reaching upward to God from, the, from our lowest weaknesses, our frailties in our flesh. He was reaching out to God. So he was fully human in all limitations, all weaknesses. And in these weaknesses, he was reaching upward to God in the lowest depths of human frailty. Okay, So he was the only man who could do this okay and because of him we you know no matter where we are who we are we can approach god it's because of jesus because he was our true representative he is our true uh, representative okay so as a mediator you know uh, it was god who was reaching down to men in christ jesus how, how is God reaching down to man in Christ Jesus as a mediator? As a mediator, how was God reaching down to man in Christ Jesus? Through his love, through his caring. Okay, through his love, through his care, through his compassion. How was God reaching down to man in Christ Jesus? What was lost with the first Adam that was getting reconciled with the second, last Adam through okay. Jesus Christ? What was lost in the first Adam was being this reconciled to the last Adam, that is Jesus Christ. Okay. When God became man, he was able to reveal the father heart of God. He was able to reveal the nature. He was able to reveal the attitudes. He was able to reveal the essence, the mind of God the Father to us human beings, okay? And also it was, he was as God and who became fully man, he was reaching out to God as a human being. So in both the sense. And because of him, 
you know, because of Jesus Christ, God and man were reconciled. Okay, what's the meaning of reconciled? God and man was reconciled. Okay, the relationship was restored. We were joined. We were reunited. We were, uh, things were resolved between God and man. Okay, when Adam and Eve sinned, we became enemies of God. Okay, we became slaves of Satan. We were no longer friends with God. We no longer had that fellowship with God. But in the man Christ Jesus, the God who became man in Christ Jesus, we were reconciled back to God. So it was God reaching down to man in Christ Jesus in revealing who God was. And it was also God who became man was reaching out to God on behalf of mankind. And because of that, we were, because of him, we were reconciled back to God. Okay. All of you with me able to understand? Yes. Okay. Okay. Look at what Acts chapter 2 verse 22 says. Thank you, Esther Clement. Acts chapter 2 verse 22. Can one of the online students please read Acts 2 22, please? Yes, sister. I will read. Thank you, sister. Uh, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did did through him in your midst as you yourselves also know amen so who is speaking these words in acts chapter 2 who is speaking these words in acts chapter 2 peter peter yes peter, yeah. uh, so peter is speaking his uh, is preaching a sermon okay when was this in acts chapter 2 look at your bibles after the holy spirit was given to them the yes, power so of the, the holy of, spirit yes, the power of the holy spirit on the day of pentecost, pentecost yes. Yes. thank you to get rude so here he's um uh, peter is revealing about who this jesus christ is okay and he's revealing an important truth about the humanity of jesus christ and what is, what is he talking about here about Jesus Christ? What aspect of uh, him is he talking about here? In verse 22 of Acts, chapter 2. What is he talking about? About what aspect of Jesus Christ he's talking about? The signs, miracles and wonders. Look at your Bibles, <laughs> you know, it's written there, it's signs, miracles and wonders, which he did in your midst, okay? And so what is uh, Peter trying to say here? Why is he talking about Jesus' signs, miracles and wonders? That, you know, being in a human form, Yes, so Peter is saying, hey, he did all of these signs, miracles, and wonders. He did this as a human being, as a man. Look at it, it says, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, a man attested by God, who did signs, miracles, and wonders. So what is what do we learn from this? That Peter was revealing truth about Jesus Christ, that he was a human being. Okay, he was a human being. What else, what other truth is revealing about Jesus Christ here? He was, he was, he was revealing that uh, uh, what Jesus Christ did as a human is something that we can also do as a human, as yes. humans. Yes, thank you, Warren. Thank you, Nelson. Nelson also said the same thing. What Jesus Christ did, being fully human, we too can do it. He was basically saying, hey, what uh, miracle signs and wonders Jesus did. He did not do it as being God, okay, even though he was fully God, but he did it as being fully human, okay. So the mighty miracles he did, it was not him being deity, but the mighty miracles he did, he did as a man, okay, being human and within the limitations of humanity, which means we can take Jesus at his word that we can do greater things than what he has 
done because Jesus did all of his signs, miracles, and wonders in being fully human, okay? Not him being deity, but him being humanity, okay? So Jesus was a man through whom God did mighty signs, miracles, and wonders. So Jesus never attributed. Uh, so here we learn that it is through the power of God that Jesus did signs, miracles, and wonders, not by him being omnipotent, all powerful, because he refrained from using his nature of being omnipotent. So, how did he do all of these signs, miracles, and wonders? He did it by the power of God. Okay. He did it by the power of God. And uh, how do we know that he did it by the power of God? How do we know that Jesus did all of these signs, miracles, and wonders by the power of God? Jesus says, Nelson says, Jesus says that he does it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Where do we read this? Matthew chapter 12, verse 28. You know? Anyone like wants to read Matthew 12, 28? Matthew chapter 12, verse 28. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Yes, so when uh, Jesus was casting out demons, what did the people say? Hey, he's doing it by the power of the, by demons, right? So what does Jesus say? It is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons. And then he says, when you do it, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So he's saying, hey, the kingdom of God has come in your midst. Why? Because I'm doing all of these miracles by the Spirit of God, through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Okay, what is the meaning of anointing of the Holy Spirit? Anointing means what? Blessing. Anointing authority. Okay. Sorry, Warren. Uh, is it blessing, I would say. Sorry, Prem, you say that again, please. Uh, is it a blessing of the Holy Spirit? The... Blessing. Okay. Somebody here, an in-person student said authority. Warren says blessing. Okay, anointing of the Holy Spirit means two P's, two P's, the letter P. Power, yes, the power of the Holy Spirit and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Very good. The presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. When we talk about the anointing of God, anointing of the Holy Spirit, it means basically the presence and the power. Thank you, Pratt. Pratt also says uh, power. Okay. How do we pronounce your first name, Pratt? Okay. So here we see that um, even um, it, it, not only in Matthew chapter 12, later on when Jesus does miracles, but look at what he says in Luke chapter 4 when he goes to the synagogue. You know, Jesus takes the, the Torah, the law, and he reads from the book of Isaiah. And he says, this is fulfilled in your, he says, sits down, he says, this is fulfilled in your hearing. Okay. So uh, look at what he says in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. Can somebody read that, please? Luke 4, 18 and 19. Luke chapter 4, verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the broken heart, to, pro to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of the sight of to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of Lord. Verse 20. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. Yes, so what is Jesus saying here? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me and he has anointed me to preach, set the captives free. That means all those in demonic oppression and also heal and deliver people, those who are blind, those who can't see, those who can't walk. So everything Jesus did was through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
spirit. So these are very important scripture passages. They want you to, you know, keep it in mind because people will say, hey, how can somebody who's human do all of these miracles which Jesus did? Okay. How can you prove that? Luke chapter 4 verses 18 and 19, Acts 2, 22. Matthew chapter 12, verse 28, where Jesus himself says, you know, that he's doing it by the Spirit of God. Also look at what Jesus says. You know, uh, the miracles were signs not of his being deity, but being sent by the Father. Okay, look at uh, John chapter 5, verse 36. And somebody else can read John chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. Can somebody from the online students... Online students, I can only hear Kofi, Gertrude, Lucy. Can the others also participate, please? Good to hear other people's voices. Uh, this is always uh, Kofi, Gertrude, Warren, Sanjay, and Lucy who are speaking and not the others. There are 21 of them in the class. So can we hear other voices, please? It will be nice. Can somebody read John chapter 5, verse 36? And somebody else can read John chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. Can we have two online students read, please? Shall I, sister? Shall we wait for others? Yeah, can we wait for... I think Pratt wants to read. Pratt, you can go ahead. Okay. John 5, verse 36. But I have greater witness than that of John for the works which the Father has given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. Amen. Pratt, how do we uh, pronounce your first name? Pratt. Pratt. Pratt is your second name. Your first name? Dele. 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 Okay. Dele okay. Pratt. Thank you, Dele. Okay. So here we see in John chapter 5, verse 36, uh, Jesus is saying, The works that the Father has given me to finish. The very works I'm doing testify that the Father has sent me. So he's saying that I'm doing it with the power of the, uh, the Spirit or the power of God, the Father who has sent me. Look at what John chapter 10 verses 24 and 25 say. Can somebody else see that please? So the Jews surrounded him and began asking him, How long are you going to keep us in doubt and suspense? If you are really Christ, tell us so plainly and openly. Jesus answered them, I have told you so, yet you do not believe me. You do not trust me and rely on me. The very works that I do by the power of my Father and in my Father's name bear witness concerning me. They are my credentials and evidence in support of me. Amen. Thank you, Esther. Good to hear your voice. Um, so here we see that, you know, um, they're, the Jews are asking him for a sign, okay, whether he's really the Messiah. And what is what is the sign Jesus is giving them? What is the sign Jesus is giving them? His miracles, his signs, and his wonders. He's saying, hey, my miracles, signs, wonders prove that I am the Messiah. And he's saying, how does he do all of these signs, miracles, and wonders? He calls it as his works. The works he's doing is how? Power. So the power, power he has from the Father. Yes, the power and in the, the power uh, of the Father and in the name of the Father. Okay, so he's doing it all to the power of the Father and the name of the Father. And he says, all of my works actually testify about me. The testimony that, hey, I am fully human. I am also from God, from uh, above. I've come from the Father because I'm doing the works of the Father. I'm doing this in the power and in the name of the Father. So how do we do signs, miracles, and wonders? The power of the Holy Spirit, or the power of God, and in the name of, uh, in the name of God, okay? Whether Father, Son, Holy a spirit. So all these verses are very, very uh, important, good for you all to keep it in mind. Also, we uh, look at uh, John chapter 14, verses 10 and 11, where it's talking about the indwelling presence of the Father in Jesus. All of these, uh, uh, these are not in your notes, right? All of these verses? It's there? Oh. 
Uh, look at what John chapter 14, verse 10 and 11 says. Can somebody read that, please? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? What I'm telling you, I do not say on my own authority and of my own accord, but the Father who lives continually in me does the works, his miracles, his own deeds of power. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. If you cannot trust me, at least let these works that I do in my Father's name convince you. Amen. Thank you, Esther. So uh, what is he pointing out here? What is Jesus saying here? Okay, what is he saying specifically about himself here in John chapter 14, verses 10 and 11? It's not through his authority. It is by the Father's authority that he is doing. Yes, very important. Thank you. He's saying he's not doing things on his own authority. He's doing it in the authority that comes from the Father. That means Jesus is saying what? I am in the Father and the Father in me. I'm in the Father and the Father in me, okay? What do we understand about Jesus' deity and humanity here? Even though I have authority as God, because I'm fully God, I'm refraining from using my authority, but I'm using the authority and limiting myself as a human being, and I'm giving, using the authority that is coming from Father, from God. Okay, and who is doing the works in him? Yes, the father. Look at that. He says, rather, it's a father living in me who is doing the work. So, who is doing the works? The sign. What is the meaning of work here or works? Huh? Signs, miracles, and wonders. Yes, and he is doing it through the father. Okay. The Father who is dwelling in him is the Holy Spirit that is dwelling in him. Okay. And he's saying, hey, believe that the Father is in me. Even if you don't believe, at least what, what is the evidence that the Father is in him? What is the evidence that the Father is living in him? His works that he is doing. Okay. So another important uh, verse here, John chapter 14, verses 10 to 11, all testifying and we are trying to testify and prove that Jesus, what are we trying to testify and prove to these verses? Jesus is human, yes. What aspect of his humanity we are trying to prove? Ah, yes. What aspect of his humanity we are trying to prove here? Yes, go ahead. Yes, Esther. His ability to do miracles and wonders. Yes, thank you. Very good. His ability to do science, miracles and wonders is by being human. That is why we're looking at these scripture passages. Okay. Now, also look at what the apostles talk about Jesus' science, miracles and wonders, which he did. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Okay. We'll stop here. Okay. we we'll look at... Uh, this from next week. Anyone has any questions? Any questions? No questions? Any doubts? Anything you want me to explain? Okay. There are no questions, no doubts. I posted um, the ass first assessment uh, last evening. And I just want, I have a request. I want all of you to be very honest in doing your assessments. In-person students, please don't discuss with anyone. Please don't go to any online platforms to find out the answer. Look at the notes, study the Bible, try to find out the answers yourself. Okay. It's not important about your grades, but God is looking at honesty and integrity. If you're not honest and, in, and showing integrity in a simple assessment, you cannot be trusted with greater and bigger things in the kingdom of God. A request also to the online students, please um, refrain from copying and cheating. 
please be sincere in how you answer. Uh, I've given you time till Monday. If any of you want more time, you can you can request. I can um, uh, and you can state your reason, and I can give you permission. But it's a good study. These are important truths, uh, and it's important for you as a Bible college student to know these truths and hence look at this assignment in that way so that you can reiterate and learn the truths. Okay. Thank you everyone for joining class. Have a blessed weekend. Lost God bless. Thank you, sister.